Check one. Hold on, let me just uh, see if this is. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, there we go. Great. Yeah, so the, the reason I never really do that is because I, predominantly I speak to bands on the podcast and you, you just can't rely on bands to just keep up their end of the bargain. You can't trust them. So, um, it's just, Which is weird given that quite a lot of their life is around microphones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, what I'd love, I mean, this is literally, I mean, I'm sort of at this age and this point in my life now that when I, when I connect with someone on the podcast and they, they've got a nice mic and they're in like a room that like, like I've, I've spoken to people before and they're walking down the street, you know, like they pick up the phone and they're, they're on their mobile and they're walking down the street. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like what, what are you doing? I've turned off so many great interviews. <laughs> yeah. I watched in the pandemic when, um, Josh Gad did all of that, like, uh, reuniting old casts. Yeah. And I could, I could only last about 10 minutes of the Wayne's world one. Because Mike Myers' audio was so bad, that was worse than getting COVID in many ways. <laughs> well, I I have a rule that like I'll normally I'll not I'll normally publish anything, but I normally put things out as like bonus episodes when they yeah you know when they don't. They, they, Is it just uh, does this just go out audio or do you do the video as well? I sometimes do video. It sort of depends how the other person feels, but I'll normally get something on the audio feed and then. Sometimes I'll put the video up afterwards and then kind of yeah. cross promote the two things. This is all very yeah. interesting, isn't it? What? Yeah. Why? Why do you not do your podcast anymore? I mean, no, it's been a long time since you've done it. No, I, you... we still, I still, I still have um, the dirty air. Like we, I do a um, Formula One podcast with another comedian, and that sort of it's grown in a way that was it's just so much bigger than than my own one. Oh, I used, um, to, I used to really like the is it excitable boy. Yeah, wow, you're you're one of a handful. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm, an OG, I'm an OG. I remember that there was an episode. I about, had no idea. There was an episode about your dream, uh, your dream human centipede that I don't think was that long before you wrapped up, and I, uh, I fucking laughed myself silly listening to that episode. Well, my Tim, who I hosted the show with, he's got a kid now, and he's in um, he's in the Harry Potter show. All right. Okay. So he just has no time, but also it was sort of like I was I wasn't doing music anymore, and I just sort of needed a minute to like reset and and also no one more importantly if we'd had a fo- a big following, yeah, I would have kept doing it. But it was like it it we I, we were so bad at podcasting when we started, and I'm really grateful that we did it for like the four years that we did it because I learned so much about you know, hosting and, and how to listen and how to improv and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's with the, with the dirty air one now, it's that just eats up so much time because, you know, it's every week. I and, mean, uh, form, what's formula one? I, I don't really get it. Yeah. And I feel like it's such a terrible way to start your podcast. Cause it's just going to alienate everyone. Cause it's the dumbest, it's the dumbest sport. On the maybe after cricket, it's the worst, stupidest, dumb, idiotic, like nepotistic m- money and just disgusting oil money and horrible. Like, but it's it's my it's my. Th- there's an old Doug Stanhope stand up where he's talking about I think it's American football and he says it's it's my stupid. Don't ruin my stupid. Right. Okay. And that's how I feel about F one. Like I, sh- it, I'm aware. I would never try and defend it to people that don't like it. But I just, I just love it. I love it. But what, what do you love about it? I love all the cheating and the infighting and uh, <laughs> okay. and all the drama. And then when you get a good race, which that's the thing with F one is, it's when you get a good race, which is probably one in seven races. So that's about four a season. Right. So it's not a great sport <laughs> but i just I'm, I'm on it i'm in now i can't i can't i've been watching this since i was five years old i mean i i love sport um i mean there are i mean i, I can't stand cricket i got forced to play rugby as a kid in a desperate mm. attempt to make my dad proud that didn't <laughs> that didn't work uh so there's loads of sports i don't like but i i'm big on sport like i'm absolutely crazy on football and um who's I, your team doncaster rovers football club 
Literally, um, l- literally the worst team in South Yorkshire at the moment. Like the the football league table, but not the worst in the whole of Yorkshire. Um, well, you know, this league's below where we are, but okay. we, we are pathetic, like utterly <laughs> pathetic. I mean, the last season was intolerable. But I, I, um, I like a lot of other sports. I like I like things like snooker and I like darts and things like that. But I really yeah. like boxing, and I think the thing with sport is you sort of have to. In many ways, I think the sport is the best of us, but it's absolutely the worst of us as well. Yeah, it's I, that's how I feel. Is I like football is such a beautiful sport to watch, but when you're on the tube home after a gig, and <laughs> yeah, and there's a that group mentality and that frequency, uh, like the footballers all kind of uh, operate at like that. Yeah. I'm, it, um, but at the same time, the older I get, the more you lean on sport for joy because. You know, I kind of, whatever movie comes out, I kind of get it. There's going to be a hero. There's going to be a storyline. There's the revenge or love or whatever it is. But, like, sport just remains exhilarating. And I think the older you get, the more you become impassioned to the ones that you connect with, definitely. Yeah, and there's something about as well giving yourself to something that you just, you have no control over. I mean, I'll get this. I was sort of thinking about this when you were talking about, uh, when we were sort of briefly talking about making podcasts, you know, a big, I have OCD, so a big part of my kind of treatment is about trying to veer away from an obsession with perfectionism. So sometimes it's like, well, you know what? If I've done this interview with someone and it kind of clanks a bit or a car beeps its horn and I can't cut out the audio, then fuck it. Because otherwise I just won't do anything because I will get so obsessed with things being this impossible to reach form of perfectionism in my brain. And I feel a little bit like... um, I don't really know why I'm saying that. I feel a little bit like with the uh, with sport, it's almost like it's something I can't control. It's like yeah. I'm just putting I'm just putting my faith in this, and it'll be what it'll be. But yeah. I do I do think it's that thing you were saying that about Formula One, and just how kind of you know how you, your words. I'm not dissing your sport, but almost <laughs> like how disgusting it is in lots of yeah. ways. I feel like that about boxing. Like I'm like. You know, violence freaks me out. You know, if I'm out on the street and there's a fight outside a pub, I'm like finding a finding a a, a bunker to hide in. I hate it. it. It freaks me out. But I absolutely love watching people beat the shit out of each other. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And, and I kind of hate that about myself. It's like it's ticking into some primal. Yeah, it's that ani- it's the animal side of the brain, isn't it? Where you just. Yeah. You, and that's what makes Formula One so boring is that I know every week that Red Bull are going to win, and that just it just quashes the. You have to. That's the that's the difficult thing loving that sport with the last two years is you just have to ignore the winner, and that's so. Like um, Alfie, my co-host said, he was like, if I watch a bad football game and they lose seven nil, I still get to see seven goals. Yeah. And if you you know if you're watching an F1 race and it's just Max Verstappen a minute in front of everyone it's it's hard to find the joy in it you know are you i think you're if wikipedia is correct i think you're seven years younger than me do you remember a video game called speedball mm, was that an arcade game no it was on well no i don't think it, no i don't think it started out in the arcades but it was it was a popular game on the amiga and the atari st that era of i suppose you'd call it 16 bit in the 90s and there was this game called Speedball 2, and it was made by uh, a developer called the Bitmap Brothers, who made loads of like classic games of that era. I mean, they all you know sort of look archaic when you see them now, but Speedball 2 was this like um, it was almost this sort of like 2000 AD Judge Dredd take on American football, and like super <laughs> super super violent. And I always was like, this should be a real sport. You know, everyone's like, it, like all the players are like wearing like body armor, you know, but like yeah. not like American football body armor, like literal like armor. And um, I was just playing. I think I remember, I do remember this. Yeah, they had like big shouldered metal yeah. Um, armor. Th- yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ringing a bell. Yeah, and famously it had a, a, a sample. You, you'd be sort of like slugging it out in a game and then you just hear someone in the crowd go, ice cream. And like, they used to crack us up when we were kids, you know. I think there should be an Olympic, like a separate Olympic sport where they can just all do roids. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, like, let's see how far, like, what's the guy's name? Lance Armstrong. Like, imagine all 40 of them <laughs> are all juicing. 
this is, this is this. we will see how far we can take peak athletic humanity if everyone is roided off their tits. Well, there's all these conversations at the moment about you know, uh, like gender within sport, and believe me, that is a topic far too spicy for me to be getting into with you today. But it does make me think while we're having a conversation about fairness within sport that we should really just have a league of a particular sport that fairness doesn't even come into the equation, which is almost what you're saying, really. But it's almost yeah. like if you want no rules, bring, if you want to bring like an AK-15 into <laughs> into the game then that's fine if you want to bring a sword that's fine <laughs> do, you have, do you have any interest in wrestling uh, um uh not even i mean i watched a lot of it during the pandemic really but that was just because it, you know at 11 p.m what else is there to do um so me and my housemate got really into it but i know i've tapped out hugely uh, no pun intended no pun but, intended, um yeah, yeah. no it's but, just no they... It's because they used to have like a sort of no, like no holds barred matches, and I always used to be like, or like sort of um, anything goes, and I was just mm. be like, well, isn't that just like legal murder? You know, like when someone would bring out like chairs and you know, like a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire, I'd be like, well, what's the difference between that and a sword? Um, but there you go. Listen, let me ask you some questions about you rather than yeah, great, let's go rattling on. You um so I was aware of you basically when you were a, a musician, um, but that's kind of in the rearview mirror now, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah, haven't um, haven't picked up a guitar since um, since I stopped. I mean, apart from like the comedy sketches and stuff, if I'm making a music thing, but no, professionally, yeah, completely. I say over, but I mean, it never really, it it never really happened. So I don't really see it as something that I quit really it was just i you know it never got beyond being in a small sticky dirty cold van um uk indie chart and, at number 11 josh that's an achievement yeah but that was my um well, i think that was my second ep so that was before the, the i was in a punk band called the kenneths so i was yeah. a solo artist in the sort of late 2000s and then in the mid 2000s teens or whatever i started a punk band so there were two kind of different careers um but yeah I, I i still don't know if it charted at number 11 and also i think in the cd sales sing like charts in 2000 i don't i think i only had to sell about 20 copies to get yeah, to number 11 yeah it probably it would probably get you to the top of the charts now though that's the thing yeah that's isn't that mental yeah it's so mad now how I, I can't remember which like post hardcore band it was. I was some Victory Records band. I heard an interview with one of them, and he said that the label saw the album as a failure because it on, only sold two out hundred thousand copies the week it came out. And I was like, that would be the biggest album of the year now. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, my wife manages bands, so whenever there's a, whenever she's got a, one of her acts have got an album out, our house is like quite neurotic it's like you know midweeks and then you know what, what's it gonna be the end of the week but it really has become like who it's really like a sort of a battle of marketeers like it's oh, almost yeah. like or how many it's almost like how can we dupe people how can we yeah. release as many different formats as possible or put things at a, diff, a different price point in different places and it's like and maybe we'll scrape 2000 sales that'll get us to the top of the national charts which is fucking insane so i won't so i do tell her this if her acts don't do particularly well but, but no but i mean going back to what we were saying i mean you I, I i think you should be very proud of what you did with music you know like i think that certainly the people you played with and people you crossed paths with like that's not a that's not an insignificant achievement i think just no yeah no i mean especially with the with the punk band with the kenneths that was like you know, getting to tour with bands that I listened to when I was 12 um, and, uh, you know, working with Bill Stevenson and stuff like that. That I mean, you know, I, I have a Descendants tattoo on my leg. So to work with Bill from the Descendants, and uh, if for anyone who doesn't know, for Black Flag, Black Flag's drummer in, for a period in the 80s, as well as producing everything from like No Effects to Alkaline Trio and 
for him to to like believe in us and have us come tour with them and to produce our records is that that you know bill and bill is like whenever i'm on telly doing stand up now he texts me and he's become like an uncle and you know every time he's in town we go for a curry and which is a challenge because that man can eat um yeah, and he insists yeah. that because he had a brain tumor that he can't um taste the spice anymore so it's mental whenever we go out but like yeah that side of it is is wild the solo stuff which is kind of what my edinburgh show is about is 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 a, is far less um i don't know i mean pride is a i think pride is something you have um when you're looking in the rearview mirror as i'm I'm still very much focused on the future, so maybe in time I'll look back on it um, a bit more. But for, but for now it was um, it, it it was uh, it was it was a really difficult thing. Any musician listening to this knows that it's in, like I had I had a show last night and there was a band in the front row. And as much as it was fun to take the piss out of the fact that you know I, I was mock, I was joking around saying that they were never going to get signed, yada yada yada, you know, and it was all in good jest, yeah. but. And then I played their song. I found the, the name of the band and I played it, you know, to the audience on the stage and made everyone review the the band. And and what a, you know, what, the, what a cunt! I, <laughs> sorry, yeah, you're absolutely right. No, I am into it. I'm into it. But then, but that coming from the 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 space of having been a musician, like I just, oh god, I I just feel I feel so impassioned and like and emotionally you know like not trauma but like every band now has it so much harder than i did and i when i got signed in 2010 i signed to universal for like a year i think before they realized that what, what they'd done and um but i remember when i got signed and everyone went oh mate it's a shame it's not the 90s anymore because it was way better back then but now everyone looks back on the period that I was signed in going, oh, 2010, that was a good, you could get a good advance. Whereas me experiencing that, it was really difficult. It was the dead, it was this weird dead space in the music industry where, you know, um, around 2010, it wasn't quite DIY, do it on your own, SoundCloud, Spotify, self-release. There wasn't that, but there also, it was still, you still relied on physical sales. The internet didn't exist in the way. Yeah for musicians that it does now. So I found that period really hard, but I mean, the, the, the way, especially with, um, you know, for Europe, for bands in England, the way Brexit has ruined the ability for bands to freely tour and make money abroad, um, as well as, you know, the, the, the rising prices of vinyl production. Now there's basically no profit margin for bands. Their merch costs have gone up. Like I just, it, absolutely breaks my heart I, I was talking to the bass player of, of the kenneths and he's now in a band called dry cleaning who are smashing it and oh, they went did not know that yeah yeah they're, they're brilliant they're yeah, absolutely I remember, brilliant i love that band and he said that when they played brooks and academy he did the math and realized that the bouncer was making more money on the door of brooks and academy that night than he was god it's crazy well you know the the bouncers on the door of brooks and academy have infamously been <laughs> Taking a few backhanders as well, but you know. Yes, that's that, uh, there. Yeah, uh, and, uh, I mean, I hope, I really hope they don't close that venue. I, I mean, I just, I, I, I don't want to live in a city where we're just shutting every venue down now. It's just no, uh, neither, neither do I. But I'm like, I, I get, I, I found that quite hard on Twitter actually, with a lot of people who've been like, we must save this venue, and I'm like, well, let's just, let's just, let's just make sure it's safe first. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's, exactly. been a few, there's been a few times over the years I've been in that venue where I've been a bit like, I mean, again, I refer to OCD and the fact that I'm terrified of everything. But a few times I have been, there seems a lot of people in here. So, you know. Yeah. If they, if things Brixton, Br Brixton and Scala are the only two venues in the world where I've ever been put in a neck hold by a bouncer for something that wasn't my fault. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Fuck, fuck, fuck those guys. Also, Scala's just, it's a, lot, a big climb in it. You know, it's like if I go to a gig, I don't want to feel like Shackleton or something before a band even starts. Like that, I've climbed all of these. I mean, I could just stop eating so much, really. But like, it, I always feel exhausted before I even get in the venue. I have not been. I haven't been to Scala for at least ten years. I don't think it's it's sort of gone off the radar for a lot of touring bands. It's not really that. It used to be the stepping stone to like Shepherd's Bush, 
and now it's sort of you can go from the smaller venue to that without having to do Scala now. So when you signed your deal, if that you know that was the end of the end of the indie sleaze era, I guess mm. sort of modern parlance. Although having worked at the enemy for you know almost ten years during that era, we never used that term once. Um, you would have been really young. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I moved to London when I was nineteen, and I got signed when I was twenty-two. Fucking hell. Um, so it was kind of all over by the time I was. By the time I was twenty-four, I was working back in a toy shop, or for minimum wage. So. And but was comedy something that was bubbling during that time, or was it? I, I don't yeah. Know where, oh, where huge, yeah, massively. From? Yeah. Right. Um, it came from just. I just it, it, I I was just always better in between the songs in a way. And um, okay, okay. and um, there are a few moments I remember. You know, I'll uh, timeline wise, I'm going to jump around a bit here. But again, for, for, I was a solo artist from around 2008 to about 2014. Then I started a punk band, which went on to about 2018. And it was when I was in the punk band when we, we opened for Leanne Le Havis at the Royal Albert Hall, which was just the dumbest lineup choice. She asked us to come and open, and um, I think we got paid a hundred pounds to play the Albert Hall, but. And, and I remember thinking in between the song, sorry, I was walking onto the stage and I remember thinking, oh, yeah, I can't wait to tell some jokes in between the songs. <laughs> yeah. And that was the the pivotal moment when I just went, oh, fuck, I need to quit. Bollocks. Yeah. yeah. And, but, but yeah, I remember meeting a, a comedy agent and I had no skin in the game. Like I'd written a few scripts for fun and, and, and whatnot, but I, the comedy agent represented uh, a stand up who I was friends with. And the agent said to me, he went, Oh, you're Josh. He went, every time my, my act tells me his new joke, he always says he wrote it. And, and that was like four or five years before I started doing stand up, And that was a point in my head where, when I look back on it now and go, Oh yeah, that was a moment when I went, oh, okay, I should maybe be doing comedy. Right. And, um, and also everything in comedy kind of getting an agent, all the dreams that you have, of, if, of, if you want to work in entertainment or show business where, you know, someone comes to see you like chomping a cigar and goes, hey, got skills, kid. And those kind of dreams where you get signed really easily, n- n- that never happened in music. Everything was an uphill struggle. I got like very reluctant agents and and, and couldn't get a press agent, couldn't get, ma- couldn't get a record deal, all that stuff. Whereas in comedy, everything sort of fell into place. I never, I still don't quite know how I'm here. Like I haven't tried for it, you- which is... Do you think that's the difference between the industries, though, or just that maybe, and I, I've already cleared my throat by saying that I enjoyed the music you made, maybe yeah. you were just better at comedy? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Right. And that's what my that's what the Edinburgh show is about as well, is it's an analysis of, um, it's firstly like the Edinburgh show is, uh, which for anyone listening is there, there's an Edinburgh Fringe Festival where if you, you, I'm doing my debut hour this year, so I'm taking my show up and you do it for the whole month. And the show is about, um, firstly, it's a love letter to pop music, but it's also my journey through the getting signed and getting dropped and trying to be a pop star. Right. But it's also, it's an, it's, it's an analysis of, is, did, was I doomed from the beginning because of the music industry or, or was my music just shit? And it, it, it was that, um, you know, well, I just, I, mean, I was, I was fine. I was, I was fine. I wasn't like amazing, but I wasn't the worst. I mean, I, um, I don't think music's a meritocracy, though. I think that's the thing. You know, you don't I, think so? No, no, I don't. I think I think some of the biggest artists in the world are some of the most. Some Name of the, three. Sorry, don't. What? don't. The, 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 <laughs> no, let's not do that. I mean, I could eat, I could eat, I could easily <laughs> do it. Like, I mean, every, but do you not think that with music you can? It's a meritocracy to a point, but you can get a record deal by knowing the right people and being in the right places and looking the right way. But I think it, through my experiences, I, you know, so many people got signed, but it was the only ones that had bangers that are still around now. I mean, I feel that I, I feel like music is like, I feel like there's almost no, I was kind of like, I was talking about this yesterday. I, I was talking about this yesterday with a man called Lurk, who mm-hmm. their episode, who were really good. They're from Chicago and, really interesting band and um you know younger than you 31 i think the single was i was talking to and we were talking about this and i don't know it's weird when you speak to people who are a lot younger 
and they see things in a different way and you're like well it's because you can't it's because you weren't aware of what it was like before this so mm -hmm. you can't really sort of see what we've lost and I, I'm, not, I'm not down on music at all like i think that you know everything is secular and in the same time but then i think the world's in an insane time you know there's so many things about the world or about politics or the environment or you know they reckon ufos are real which i'm banging to by the way but like you know we, we live in strange times right so it's not just the music industry we're in a weird time of flux this is this is the industrial re revolution you know the, yeah this is the the birth of the printing press everything is up for grabs and it's fucking weird but yeah. i think that what i do think with increasingly with bands is like technology and the suits have kind of dismantled the alternative to what they do uh so it's increasingly hard for you to do anything in a diy way because of uh, the demise of physical products and how difficult it is to tour. I sound a bit. I sound like a bit like a conspiracy theorist saying all this. I don't think it was probably coordinated like that, but mm. like almost like they've taken away the other way of doing it. But also, I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is I think that I don't feel like you've got a lot of autonomy if you're a musician now. Like I actually feel like, and you know, I've been in the music industry for twenty plus years, but. There are, of course, there are people who like you know are at magazines or websites or uh, work in what A and R is now, or they run record labels that are music enthusiasts, right? Yeah. But I actually feel, in a way, that there are people who the musicians are almost the last. It's not like they're signing them for talent. It's almost like they're signing them so they can be what they want them to be. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah like like in your head as a musician you're like well you know i write i write great songs like i would be an asset and i and i don't think actually a lot of people within the industry see see the musician as the asset i think they're like well you well, I, I i could get i could make some money off this yeah. which maybe has always been the case you know you talked to did an episode recently with the zombies from the, the 60s who i think are one of the best bands ever and they sort of talk about almost this sort of uh, conveyor belt of, uh, I mean, they, they talk about the music industry in the sixties as being horrendous, you know, and, we, and mm -hmm. yet we think about it as this great time of, you know, amazing art, but I think it's always been thus, but I just think that like, I don't think it's like, I don't think fairness is in any part of the conversation. Right. <laughs> Whereas I feel like comedy, it's like, I mean, you, it's, it's you, isn't it? I mean, who who's the I mean obviously there's gatekeepers but if you're fucking funny and you and you make a podcast and you can get that to people and loads of people listen to your podcast because you're fucking funny that's gonna yeah it. it's like it's I think if you if you look at it at the lowest level like let's say I'm in a band and we're doing the old blue last and then I'm in a I'm a comedian and I'm doing a ten minute spot in a you know open spot in a comedy club um that old blue last gig is going to cost me 500 pounds, 300 pounds to do. Cause you have to hire a rehearsal space. You have to get all the gear there. The Uber driver might not want to take your gear. So you might have to hire a zip van. Um, you get paid 50 quid. You're in the hole. You can't afford to, to make your merch and you walk away from that gig in the hole. Whereas as a comedian is you take a notepad and a pen it costs you a tube fee. So that side of it, like the financial side is, is huge. Um, and you know, I'm, I get to make a living from comedy, which is mental. It's insane for, I, for I'm four years in and, you know, four years into the Kenneths, we were just in debt. And, um, yeah. so I think that side of it is very true. I do think it's more, I think it's more of a natural meritocracy. If you can go into a comedy club and kill every time, which I, you know, I should be so lucky as to say every gig went, went amazingly well, but Again, if you if you're one of those people, one of those players that can just go in and crush, that gets around quickly. And I yeah. don't think music has that. I think music relies so much more on, you know, what's your follow account, what's your social media, you know, um, what do you guys look like, you know, yeah. who's to, you know, there's that side of it is a, is still the wild west for music. Yeah. Yeah, I think we probably, I think we're we're saying similar things. Really, it's just that thing, I guess, that you sort of, 
I mean, we're so far away from this now, but I guess that kind of, you know, if you've watched any of the sort of great sort of music centric comedies, whether it's, you know, Wayne's World or Airheads or whatever, mm. you know, almost like it's that kind of narrative of like, you form a band, you write a great song, you get spotted, that's your ticket to the stars. And I yeah. just don't think that's, that's been the, maybe that hasn't ever been the case, but it certainly hasn't been like that for years and years and years because it is so dependent on things like, a scene and there's just so many other variables where I just think that if I go to a comedy club and someone's fucking funny, like that just resonates in a way that I just, it, it just, it almost, and I love music more than anything in the world, but just in a way that I don't think I ever did with music really. Like mm. it's very rare that I went to see a band that I didn't know anything about and came home and went, I've got a new favorite band. That's like, yeah. Just... Like if you went to me, do you want to go to a comedy club tonight? I'd go, yeah, why not? If you went, do you want to just go watch a gig? I think you were fucking mental. (laughs) (laughs) You'll actually just see what's on and just go on Dice and just randomly go to a gig. You'd be like, that, you need help. (laughs) Um, I wonder who's playing in town tonight. What the fuck? That's insane. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's the difference is, but that's the thing with where comedy clubs come into it is you rely on the reputation of the club. So you can go, oh, yeah, I know that there's going to, let's go here, let's go to that club. And there's five, six places in London where you can kind of go and kind of guarantee that there's going to be good acts on. And I don't think the music scene has that. But to me, that's, it is, it like, as, as you said, the state of flux that the music industry is in at the minute or the world is in, which reflects in, in the way that people make music or promote music or play gigs, I do think that something's coming like the way that punk rock came out of, you know, Thatcher is right. like, I do think around the corner is going to be, or whether, you know, where grunge came from, from like Reagan era, if I'm, if my, if I'm right, but like, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. You know, or yeah, forgetting, you know, punk coming from a rebellion to prog and grunge coming as a rebellion to like hair metal. But like, I do think, when, I, when you put on like Capital Radio and it's just another guy going, I remember. And the next thing has to be around the corner. There's going to be a big cultural musical revolution soon, I hope. I mean, I, I guess I was talking about this again on this podcast that will probably air after this one um, with the guy from Lurk. And we were talking about, you know, he was talking, like their last, re- their debut record was basically kind of made, it was released like early early 2020 so it was like sort of dead on arrival in many ways but yeah he was talking about how just how strange the world had become you know whether it was trump or um he was talking a bit about like brexit and just the rise of populism and, and so on and i think the world is even more even stranger than that i think there that's like just obvious sort of touchstones really I, I think there's something very strange that's gone on with um the uh the transition from a, a like a physical world to a digital world within kind of cultural spaces. I think we're seeing something weird because of that. But um, and we were still talking about how whether we thought good art was produced in um, whether g- good art was produced out of anger and discontentment and always that thing of like you know I remember when Trump got in and people would be like, well at least the music's going to be good. And I, I I don't know whether I see it like that actually i sort of feel like actually so much good art comes from times of optimism and hope and i feel like there's such a dearth of optimism and hope i wonder i wonder whether great art can really flourish like Mm. it's maybe different within kind of comedy right because you've got a so much of that is about pointing at the ridiculous but with music i'm a bit like yeah you know we might get some angry intense music but when i think about sort of i don't know acid house or i think about sort of flower power or whatever like these things came from like moments of joy you know and i I can't see a lot of that around right now yeah that's the yeah would you rather have a really good um aggressive angry sweaty punk rock scene from a a dystopian world or or just live in a in a nice country (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? and, I, and have some happy music yeah that's a it's a real coin toss that yeah let, let me ask you a question there's some questions about comedy though i'm really i'm really interested in comedy i i guess in a way i've always you know i've always craved 
you know, doing stand up. I, I did some open mics and stuff years and years ago. I, I wasn't very good, but I do like writing funny things. That's always been a big, mm. you know, even, you know, record reviews and stuff like it. it was always important for me to try and be funny. And um, so I do increasingly kind of like, almost like the more miserable the world gets, almost like more I've engaged with comedy, I see. And, um, and I know a few comedians and they all tell me that comedy is gross. They all tell me that it's like behind the scenes, it is fucking gross. And obviously I worked in the music industry, you know, 20 years. So I'm aware that grossness thrives. What's comedy like? What do you mean by gross? That it's a place of, I'm not even really being the obvious really when I say gross, you know, I don't necessarily mean it's sort of like abusive environments, but just that it's, mm. It's not, there's not much of a community there. Everyone kind of is like watching what everyone else is doing. Everyone's trying to sort of get one up on it. it, it there's a lot yeah, of. Yeah, like... I mean, I, maybe that's true. Yeah, I think, I think, I think the benefit of having had a sort of attempted career in music is I just kind of, I've learned to just not engage and swerve around that. And for me, is if you can be nice and be funny you kind of don't have, you know, I, like, I, I mean, do, when I started doing open mics, it was just a competitive, very incel kind of, um, you know, who are you, you know, don't, you're not part of this gang, which I, I felt that my whole music career, I never really felt accepted by any scene or any, any of the bands that were in London. Yeah. And so this time around, I kind of had that armor, but I do think after a point, like I remember saying it to a, to another comedian when I started and he was sort of eight, 10 years in and I went, Jesus, he's like, these, are, these, not, these people are weird. These, like it's, they're really horrible and they're bullish and, yeah. you know, and, and, and my mates went, yeah, but they burn off. He's like, if you keep doing it and you start to excel, they just disappear. And it's true. Like I haven't been to a comedy club since the pandemic, really since I started doing like, since I became a professional you know, uh, inverted commas comic like that. No, it's everyone's just there to work. And, and I, I, pers I personally find, you know, the company of comics like awesome. And, and, uh, you know, you find your people, you know, you find the people whose acts you love and, you know, that you get along with or even acts that you don't particularly love, but you get along with the person. And, you know, I've made some really, really great friends, but, um, you do sort of learn how to swerve around the slightly um, nuttier ones, but that's just, you know, I think, I think just because of my age, you know, everyone, you, when you start open mic, I was 31 and everyone else was 20. So you do kind of just learn to, you know, I'm like, well, what, what kind of, why would I, I don't, I'm a, I don't need to hang around with 20 year olds again. I'm good. And so, you know, I, I think I've kind of avoided that that side of it a little bit. I think I've been very lucky. I mean, do you, this is almost, I feel like I need to do some throat clearing before I ask this question. I guess that like, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I get quite, I get quite concerned about like cancel culture is an, amor an amorphous term that at this point, who knows what it even really means. Of course, there are people who behave in such a way that they should be shooed away from polite society. But I do get quite, uncomfortable with the idea of um, people self-censoring and people being, uh, especially when it comes to things like comedy, because I'm a little bit like, there's so there's so much humour in the things that we would never say outside of a room of people who have almost kind of accepted the, the unspoken contract that this is a place that we will laugh at how cruel and weird our lives are. That's my throat clearing. Do you find that uh, comedy is a kind of fearful place or a place where you feel there's all there's a, a, a thought piece in a right wing newspaper kind of every couple of weeks about how council culture is killing comedy? I don't necessarily agree with that, but I also don't think I totally disagree with that. If that makes sense, how have you found yeah. that? Yeah, I think if you you know if you you came up in the nineties and you can't wear blackface anymore and you're mad about it. That's, 
that's one thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm absolutely just you know to make it abundantly clear. I'm, I'm not down with blackface. That's yeah. Okay, that's good not, to know. Good to know. Not, yeah, that's not a good. That's not a good vibe. Yeah, I wanted to, I, but but then on the flip side of that, I think that um, I've just again, I've just never seen it. I, 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 I maybe there are people longer in the game. Again, like like you just said about um, what was that band you were saying? The 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 oh, band from bit. Chicago. Yeah, yeah like maybe I just don't know what the industry was like before that. So if I'm a digital comic, I, I miss the analog cassette tape CD um, laserdisc era, right. and I didn't I didn't get to see how free the clubs were. But I certainly don't feel that. I just think if you you try a joke and it and it and it gets a response. I mean, I've tried so many bits that um, you try it on stage and you go, and the comics go, yeah, that was great. And it just doesn't connect with an audience. And sometimes you look at the concept of it and go, okay, well, I can see why an audience might find that um, not funny or worst case offensive. But I, again, like I just haven't really seen that in comedy clubs because i think people know in a comedy club and again you know some comics get up and they can't cut the mustard and they think that they're trying to be edgy but actually maybe you can see under the skin a little bit and it's maybe actually that's what they think and they're trying yeah, to make yeah. a joke about it and yeah. and it, i i just think if it's funny it's funny and it if you're you can joke about anything if you're a good joke writer and people know that it's not coming from a place of hate. And I think that um, if you're trying to exercise some kind of demons or not go to a therapist and you're using comedy for that, then maybe the material um, uh, doesn't get a laugh from the audience. But I, I again, I, I haven't seen much of that in the comedy club. So, yeah, um, I mean, it is. I mean, it definitely is. Um, I think sometimes people use this stuff as an excuse for i don't have to work at this do you know what i mean like there are things that are like that would have got uh, would have elicited a laugh that wouldn't have been gatekeep that are quite base that you can't do anymore because it's offensive and yeah. you haven't put in the work but i guess it's that thing of sometimes i will see things on twitter where I, someone's but again, that's probably about, that's probably more about the medium than anything, really. But sometimes I'll see people make jokes on Twitter, and I'm like, "Well, that's the next month of your life ruined." Where yeah. it's like, I know it's a joke, but there's not that. Uh, good but that's the thing. Like, if I go to a funeral and start making jokes, <laughs> you can't expect people to go, "Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good joke." But and Twitter is yeah. just don't make jokes on Twitter. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's not that space anymore. Yeah, it's become a completely different entity to what it was. And it is what it is now. So I, I just, just you know, there's there are other places to to make good jokes. Oh, and um, aren't you a wise young man, Josh Weller? No, I'm a I'm a old, nearly you know, I'm in my mid late thirties, and I, I just I'm, um, I'm forty two. I'm allowed to say that you're a, that you're a wise young soul. That's very sweet. I'm gonna have yeah. a knee surgery next week, so I don't know if the age is. Um, I don't I, know if I'm aging that well, but I interviewed a member of Radiohead yesterday who's almost sixty. Which which one? Phil, I, I mean, I, I almost sort of said this almost apologetically because it doesn't sound as impressive when I say that it was the drummer Phil Selway, but he was fucking. The, he's the bald guy, right? Yeah, lovely. lovely yeah, he's man, fucking man. great. He's yeah. such a good drummer. Oh, it's just funny you should say that, right? Because you know, when I got into Radiohead as a kid, it was all about like the, you know, sort of like frantic guitars and the sort of the you know waves of. You know, like literally, I I used to enjoy them watch, watching those men abuse their guitars, and then after that, <laughs> almost a sort of like the neurotic electro element of them. You know? And I, so I never really listened to them and went, "Oh, you know what? The guy keeping time, he's he's really good." But it, but that's a good drummer is when you don't know. Like, I, don't get me wrong, there are examples of drummers that should not be good. Like, I love Travis Barker. I, I love Blink One Eighty Two. But that format as a trio should not work. They go, it's like the, if you, if you sat down and explained uh, like the TV show Frasier to someone and you went, yeah, it's a psychiatrist who lives with his blue collar dad and their health 
worker also lives with them. You'd go, that's the dumbest idea. That would never happen. Yeah. And Blink-182 shouldn't work. Like one guy who can't sing playing the most rudimentary guitar lines and a bass player kind of holding his own playing a lot of open string, like octave um, or thirds and fifth stuff. And then this hell for leather overplaying. They've got the order wrong of the power trio, but that's where the magic is. That's I mean, why they're brilliant. There I mean, is let, no one that can play like them. Let, let and me I t- think... Let me tell you, a someone who, let me tell you, someone who saw Blink-182 headline read in, in 2014, it didn't exactly work. But I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it, I know but it they it. hated each other. That was a, that was a, that was yeah. a pre. Yeah. Um, you know that I think they've come back with a sense of awareness and and wiseness yeah. and money. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I think that um, radio, like a, a Radiohead, a, a, have you seen the Patrice O'Neill thing no. um, where he talks about white people and Radiohead? No, and he's and he listens to Creep. And that bit, and he goes, there's this bit of guitar that um, just makes white people in their souls go, oh, and it's that um, right before the chorus. He's like that. It's like that just gets into. And that's like you say, like the older you get, you know, when you you realize that the the drummer in Radiohead, the drummer in Blur, um, the beat Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys, amazing song drummer. Yeah. Um and I I love a song like um Steve Jordan as well plays with uh John Mayer and and uh, was the original Blues Brothers drummer and like that guy is a song drummer he knows how to serve the song Steve Gadd Paul Simon's drummer like he knows how to just play and be creative Abel Boreal Jr drum Paul McCartney's drummer who drums on a, a thousand miles by Vanessa Carlton and Save Tonight like listen to those drum takes they're oh, yeah. such yeah, yeah. I mean, no argument for me there at all. I mean, I guess you know my favourite band are the Ramones, right? So I'm all about like, you know, I'm all about let's lock in and you know do the job, right? So I, I guess it's just that thing that there was a few times when I was yeah, Radio Red were a band that mattered to me a lot when I was a kid. So when I was like sort of texting old friends, going, "I'm not even a member of Radiohead today," and they were a bit like, "Oh, t- t- uh, uh, Tom York," uh, uh, and I was like, no, "No, it's it's Phil the drummer," and it just was it it, it felt like I'd sort of oversold yeah. it really. But he was fucking, yeah. he was fucking lovely, and he also volunteers for Samaritans as well. So you know what a, what a dude. Oh, good for him. I mean, they did democratize the music industry and ruin it probably forever. But let's not go down that road right now. With um, <laughs> hell to, was it hell to the thief or was it hell to the thief where they were like, pay what you want, and everyone yeah. went, you can pay what you want for music. Yeah, a loaf but- of bread. Like, if, imagine if you went to the supermarket and they went, yeah, the loaf of bread is just whatever you want. You'd never pay the same price ever again. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm kidding when I say that they democratized the music industry. I don't think that they did, but it was a, it was a moment. It changed the face of the music business. I mean, they were, um, they were. There was a period of time where they sort of not then, but they sort of embodied a lot of what I found boring about music, really. And actually, mm. when I when I go back, I, some, I've dipped into OK Computer, which is a record I don't listen to very often at all, but I, I've dipped into it a few times recently. And there is a bit of like, you know, given the sort of general uh, neurotic nature of the conversation about AI and all that uh, and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, there is a bit when I listen to OK, OK Computer and I'm like, I, I was there in 97 and I know I was 17 and I had my life ahead of me, but it wasn't that bad. Like, it wasn't this... <laughs> Like it wasn't like the, <laughs> the robots weren't coming, right? Like yeah. you, can, you can maybe make That's that really claim. Good. You can maybe make that claim now, but like but you could do that before. Remember when everyone was really angry at George Bush, <laughs> and, you know? And now it's like, no, nah, was he that? Was he that? Like my my mate Alex Edelman, he wrote. Um, uh, I think I could say this, but he wrote for some jokes for George Bush for his speeches. And I think Trump was president right. and Alex went up to George Bush and he went, Hey, I, I hated you when I was in college and George Bush just went, yeah, well, how do you like me now? <laughs> and it was like, yeah, in the, with the passage of time, you look back and go, okay, it wasn't that bad, but they didn't know that in 1997, did they? Yeah. I think it was pretty bad if you were like an Iraqi at a wedding, you know, like they, <laughs> they were the people who fucking got it, you know, but I, I know, I know what you mean when you look back like, <laughs> When you look back, you're like, yeah, 
anyway. Okay, I've got a Ramones uh, question for you. Yeah, do it. So I have a theory that the Ramones were trolling um, their f- on every record because on every Ramones album, there's a count in before at least one song. One, two, three, four. Yeah. And then the song starts at a completely different tempo. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it was. Uh, they're from that yeah they've cut in from like a different take because they'll go one two three four and then the song will go and it's a completely different bpm and i think that was a very early example of trolling your audience i mean it's it's a good question i i think that in the beginning it was just ineptitude and probably amphetamines as well and then i think that it almost became a bit of a trademark because it was normally dd the bass player who really was the you know the the drug casualty uh, that did the countings. So I definitely think in the beginning, it's they're just, they can't really play. But I, from a certain point, I think it almost becomes part of like the, almost like a trope of the Ramones, you know. Um, there was something that you just said that reminded me of something I was going to ask, actually. So we were talking about humour, and you were saying almost like, like humour within music, and you were saying that almost sometimes you would go on stage and be like, I'm more excited about telling the jokes than mm. actually the, playing the songs. So my wife manages We Are Scientists, and they have a sort of similar thing. Whereas, like, I, I, I like We Are Scientists. I think they've got some really good songs, and I have to say that because they pay some of my mortgage. But they, uh, they're they really fucking funny dudes. And like, yeah. some, sometimes when I've watched them, I've been like, oh, this is good, you know? And then, But I'm kind of waiting for the skit, right? And... Uh, yeah. And I sometimes wonder whether that band would have actually been bigger than they were, actually, if they were almost like kind of one thing or the other, if that kind of makes sense. Like, I, I think that humour almost oh yeah, sort of repelled me a little bit at a certain point in my yeah. life within music. But then I interviewed Murray on an episode, Murray from the excerpts on an episode of this podcast recently, and he was talking about his frustration that humour almost has like no place in music now, which I yeah. didn't quite understand what he was kind of saying, but... I, <laughs> sort of think he might be right as well i completely agree with that yeah i think there's weird bedfellows aren't they humor and music i just think that any i think that people don't i think the majority of people don't want i don't think it's conscious but i think if adele started doing funny self-aware randy newman type songs it would tank and i think people just they want to Oh my god, I've been dumped. Oh my god, I've had a hard life. I want to feel that. I want to go and listen to Fix You and hold my life in the air and know that someone else understands the torment that I can't put into words of the human experience. Yeah, yeah. And I think that for me, all my favorite songwriters, uh, Paul Simon is maybe the one who walked the line, but I think a lot of people don't understand the jokes in his songs. But like for me, like my one of my favorite songwriters of all time is Randy Newman, right? Yeah. And he will die as the Toy Story guy who also had some other songs. And I think if you listen to like like Good Old Boys or Sail Away and like God's song on Sail Away, the, probably the best song about atheism ever written. Not that there are many. And, you know, like You Can Leave Your Hat On is like, it's a funny song. It's not a yeah, sexy yeah. song. It's about like a creepy dude who wants a girl to just leave her out. and there's an innocence to it and then tom jones and um joe cocker kind of sexified it in the 90s but there is like you know the, are the beastie boys truly revered in the way that they probably should be i don't think they quite are are the ramones i don't think that they quite are and i think that having a sense of humor about what you do or like a self-awareness and putting that into your music it just almost always bites you on the ass like, i love as i get older i really love lyle lovett um well, you know the you know the country singer yeah it is it, and, it is it is weird though because like you know like most of the hip-hop that i like is funny yeah you know, like i mean it's not 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 that it's like badges itself as funny but all of the time like i will listen to like a little wayne bar and be like that's fucking funny you know yeah. like um and you know the beatles were fucking funny so what's that um there's a kanye lyric on his first album uh when he talks about going shopping and he pulls out an american express and she goes oh my god is that a black card <laughs> and he goes yeah but i prefer the term african-american express which Please. is a fucking good joke that's such a good one-liner 
Yeah, it's such a and... shame. It's such a shame that Kanye is is. Um... I don't want to say what I'm a bit of a Kanye apologist, really, but he the guy is a genius in many ways. Uh, I think his last three albums probably I would maybe say argue against that a little bit, but um, really, I, <laughs> I, no, I, I, I don't mean that his last three albums are better than anything I could or would or will ever make, but I like self conscious college dropout internalizing himself. I can't even go to the grocery store without wearing like a, you know, a nice watch or like, that's the Kanye that I love. Cause I get that because that connects with me. So, um, yeah, uh, I was listening to uh, diamonds, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, mm. not that long ago, which is a tune I haven't listened to for ages. And it's such a fascinating song, man. It's like, it, it's properly him on the couch. I mean, it's like a funky couch, but it's yeah. pro- properly, you know, it's not, that gangster rap thing that's of sort of celebrating the celebrating excess. It's like him having this conversation with himself about the consequence of excess, but ultimately concluding, I believe that he wants it still. (laughs) It was a pretty wild thing to do in song with Shirley Bassey. Yeah. When he's good, he's the best, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I have to go interview Rat. Are you aware of Rat? The solo artist? No, Rat. The, oh, that's were, Rat Boy, sorry. No, Rat were a hair metal band from the mid-80s. They were sort of like a contemporaries of like Motley Crue um, and sort of Guns N' Roses, actually. They were sort of, you know, Sunset Strip hair metal. And um, I really like about five songs, so I'm actually quite excited about speaking to them. But Ooh. tell people where they can see you obviously at edinburgh but like where's the venue and what's the when are the dates i um just like talking about guns and roses i just interviewed the director of november rain um and we re <laughs> we re-watched the video and he talked about all the insane stuff that went on while they made that video and the, the budget doubled as they were making it and um I'm, I'm gonna edit that after this and put that on youtube but oh. it was phenomenally fun um but send, uh edinburgh send, send sorry link, i'll send, send you the me, link of course yeah, send yeah. Me the link to that. Yeah, yeah. and uh he directed faith as well and we rewatched that and it was just i just that's all i want to do in life is just watch people who made great things talk about it yeah. um yeah. but uh edinburgh is the show is called age against the machine it's um it's a it's a you know it's a love letter to pop music in the in the broader sense of what pop music is you know as you i'm sure your listeners know that it's not just you know, shampoo and Daphne and Celeste, yeah, um, or some modern acts. Um, um, but <laughs> but uh, it's um, it's a, it's about my it's you know I got it's about getting a record deal and getting dropped and trying desperately to be a pop star but just being shit at music. Um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a how to yeah 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 it's like I, I talk about you know getting signed how to do that and I talk about trying to co-write a hit with all these big pop writers and I talk about touring and I talk about uh, putting out my first single and what it's like now to listen back to just how bad that was and while at the time thinking it was actually pretty good um, I'm on it's on at the Edinburgh Festival first to the twenty seventh. Uh, seven ten p.m. in the Pleasance Courtyard, and the venue is called the Below. I think it's venue thirty three or something like that. But um, that's very exciting. Uh, and when does this come out? I'm probably going to put it out tomorrow. I see. Oh, okay. Well. Okay. Fine. Well, then I'm, I mean, I'm also I mean, in it. I mean, if it I'm in a net- Monday, then I'm, I'm sorry about that, but probably tomorrow. That's okay. I can't. Say, well, then I yeah. I'm in a. I'm. I'm also in a Netflix show that comes out at the end of the month, but I can't. I don't think I can say what it is till it comes out. Um, well, I still. But that's good. Yeah, I mean, people when they watch Netflix, they, should they look out? For they the can day? just watch, just try every show, and eventually, yeah. you'll find me. Not not Chim Empire though, because I, I just finished the last episode of that, and it was very upsetting. <laughs> uh, it's not that one, no, sadly. Um, but all mate, all thank thank you, thank you so movies. much. For, yeah, yeah, they're such evil bastards. Oh. You know, they're, apparently they're the only. Is this true that? I mean, they're the only animals that know that seek revenge. Um, I thought you were just going to make up a fact about chimpanzees. There, did you know? Like, they're the only animals that like can they can tie a perfect bow. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, let's let's populate that. <laughs> That's not made up. That's a fact. <laughs> Put it on Wikipedia. Honestly, give a chimp um, a uh, ramekin, and they can make a, a perfect souffle. Did you guys know that? I love that. Um, Josh, it's been a total pleasure, and I think we should do this again at some point. I would love that. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, we can um, talk more. Well, let's do a music industry um, episode. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, great. All right, Quite lovely. Nice. Thanks, man. See you, dude. All right, take care, mate. Bye. Bye.